Hello and welcome to Hey, Not the Face with your host, John Nash, and your producer, me, Steffi Haynes. And today, we are going to look at managers, specifically the differences between stick and ball sports managers, MMA managers, and boxing managers. But first, let's check in with our host and see how he's been doing. John, what's going on? Not much. I just got a cat on my lap, so I got to be very careful because it's, it's you know, I can't disturb her while I do the show. I got <laughs> to continually pet her while I do the show. That's her rules. What's her name? The Isla. Isla. It's a very yeah. pretty name. I like yes. that. Yes. I didn't picture you as a cat person. I'm but not. now, But now I will forever have the image of you with a cat in your lap. It's uh, like I've said, it's an abusive relationship. I give all the love to the cat. She doesn't care. <laughs> that's that's the typical human cat relationship. Yes, I guess so. So tell me about the typical fighter <clears throat> manager relationship. What is an MMA manager supposed to do? Well, a manager in combat sports, the idea of a manager is they are supposed to guide your career. Uh, they're supposed to help you choose fights, the best fights for your career. and also helps you negotiate contracts and deals to make money. So that's that's their job, their basic job. Is there a difference between a manager and an agent? Well, in the world of entertainment, there's a big difference. A manager is someone that guides your career, that helps you make choices to, to improve your do do have a better career like longevity. Does this 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 role improve your image? Does this role gonna lead to better roles? An agent is someone that goes out and finds jobs for you, goes out and, and procures like sponsorship and gets a piece of the action for doing that. But they're not worried about your long-term career. That's what an agent. But a manager and, and an agent in MMA and, and uh, boxing, those are used interchangeably. In fact, they're by legally defined that way under the Ali Act and various state, uh, state regulations. So there's no difference. The, the, those can be used interchangeably in MMA and boxing. Can you tell me what the difference is in, say, stick and ball sports and MMA and combat sports, that that type management? Because I seem to recall there being a lot of uproar over MMA managers and boxing managers not having to have a degree. Can you explain that? Well, in in the stick and ball sports, there there's a they all have they all have associations, right? Mm -hmm. And those associations have collective bargaining agreements with the all the players and the leagues. They also have rules set down that says that if you're going to be an agent for a player, you have to meet a minimum. And they have all these rules that you have to, that all these rules that apply before you can be eligible to represent a player. In other words, they have, they have a, a barrier to entry for agents. There's no barrier to entry uh, for a boxing or MMA manager. In fact, Lou Margolis, the promoter, told me a great story once about a fighter he had who had no no agent agent or manager uh, when he called him and when he showed up he said I want you to speak to my agent he goes I didn't think you had a you know a manager he said I want you to speak to my manager I didn't think you had a manager no I just got him and it was this taxi cab driver that he hired on the way there <laughs> so I thought that that very much sums it up that anybody can be a manager you know your cousin that's why you have some of these the worst managers in in sports there but for but for stick and balls agents they have, they have standardized rules in each of the leagues, that you have to meet these minimums to represent people. And one of those minimums is definitely a degree, right? At least a bachelor's. For, for some of them, it's a degree, but for other, I'm not sure all of them require a degree, but there's a test, there's a, you you can't have a criminal record, there's a there's a background check, and there's also a maximum, there's a, a, a set amount what you get as a percentage. Oh. And it's much lower than you'd see in boxing and MMA. It's like 3%, I think, for a lot of the guys, because the a lot because of the CBA, there's a very little negotiating for a lot of those agents. Yeah. Uh, for this, for the for your first contract, because it's set down what your starting wages are going to be for for uh, rookie players. Uh, where they they where they they earn it is when you are a veteran player worth something, and they know how to time the market, and play the market against the various teams. And you see baseball players and top QBs getting fifty million a year, and then they go, okay, that guy had someone that knew what they're doing. I always go back to Ken Pavia because Ken Pavia used to charge an insane amount. 20 to 25 percent depending on the client that was his fee 
20 to 25 percent. That is insane. And you're talking three to five percent over there. Boy, these fighters just don't even know. Well, legally, a manager can charge up to 30, a third, 33 and a third percent, mm. uh, which is uh, which is an insane amount. But that's a lot of that has to do with managers. The position of managers should be much more powerful in the past, especially in boxing. Um, promoters took over after a while because they put all these regulations to contain managers because they had so much power. And then they made promoters more powerful. But, you know, so very few managers are making anything like that. But the, the ones that do make a high percentage, usually they're doing something for it that they, that they get that percentage. Since we are talking about percentages and money, what is their fiduciary duty? You act in your beneficiary, which is your client's interest, rather than serving your own interest. That's what a, uh, a uh, fiduciary is. So when uh, a manager's name a fiduciary, you're required by law to manage their career or their, their or negotiate their contracts to their benefit, not your own. So all your decisions have to be at what is to their benefit, not your own. Now, I touched on this with Ken Pavia. Talk about the managers in the old days, your Monty Coxes and, and people like that. Well, it was interesting. If you go back far enough in MMA, it was a completely different landscape because the UFC hadn't dominated and conquered the space yet, right? And so you had, King, you know, all these other promotions could pay relatively comparable wages, maybe not for a few guys that, you know, the Chuck Liddell's and stuff after tough, you couldn't match. But uh, even like a king of the cage could offer comparable wages uh, for a one-time show for a lot of fighters. Then there's, you know, Rumble uh, on the Rock and, and Elite XC at one time. And Affliction was paying more than the UFC and Strike Force. And so there was a lot more options back then. So managers then operated a lot more like boxing managers where the purpose was to guide your I shouldn't say all managers because a lot of fighters just wanted to still just be in the UFC, especially through the uh, Ultimate Fighter program. But for other guys, you want to manage your fighter's career like you would a boxer is you want to play promotions against each other to get the best deal. So Monty Cox didn't guarantee. He would often you know, not have guys sign with the UFC or try to get them out of the UFC where they'd make more money. Robbie Lawler was making a lot of money outside the UFC. Uh, or he would play. He, had, he got a great deal for Matt Hughes because he got Bodog. Matt Hughes to fight out of his country and got Bodog to offer him a lot of money. Kind of backfired because apparently you know, UFC went to Matt Hughes and said, hey, we want to give you a lifetime guarantee with the promotion. And part of it was, he, I guess he dropped Monty Cox as part of the deal. But but that was the Monty Cox's game back then, and Ken Pavley was the same. That you you know use M1, use these promotions to give your fighters leverage, uh, so they could make more money, and then you get a bigger cut of that, of course. But that dried up as the the competition dried up, and now that there's just a few big promotions, all of these really rock hard coercive contracts that are very you know exclusive and hard to get out of, it's harder to play the promotions against each other, and so that style of old promoter died, dried up. The other thing the old promoters did like Monty Cox is uh, they would operate as promoters themselves. Sometimes they'd have their own promotions. You, you see that today again, but it's a little different the way they do it. But back then Monty Cox would off and off as his own promotion. And he'd use his own promotions as an alternative to like the UFC and other promotions. So he could, he could get his fighter a better deal. Talk about Monty Cox and the way he did Tim Sylvia. Well, I, I think you're probably referring to an old article that uh, our man, Kid mm -hmm. Nate Wilcox, wrote. Mm -hmm. And I kind of disagree with Nate on part of that. Because Monty Cox did a great job of getting, when he got Tim Sylvia left the UFC, he had been the UFC champion. Uh, he had just lost a, uh, a, a fight for the interim championship against Big Nog when after Randy Couture had holed out and they'd made a new title. And so he had asked to get let go, and he did. At the time, he was making like 125000 150000 a fight with the UFC. Uh, and so he got a much, much bigger deal with uh, Affliction. And this is where I described, you know, you know uh, Nate Wilcox. Like, one big fight, Nate said, doesn't make up for a career. And I'm like, this is the fight business. If you can get four or five times as much in one fight, take it, because you want to save brain cells. Get out of the business. And so he got... He got uh, Tim Sylvia a deal for 800000 against Fader Emelianenko. If, Fader, if he would have won, his next fight would have been like $1.2 or $1.3 million. Wow. It, but he didn't win. He did also have, a, in the contract, he had another fight with Affliction for 500000 Now, this is where Monty made a big mistake. 
to keep Tim Sylvia busy, he booked him for his own show uh, against Ray Mercer and probably was one of the worst decisions because if you're going to put Tim Sylvia against anyone, you don't want to put him against someone with, with quick hands and power. And that's what he booked, a real boxer. Because Tim Sylvia beats MMA guys with his striking because they weren't good strikers back then for heavyweights. He could hold them at the eighth of distance. For Ray Mercer, Tim Sylvia was, was someone walking through water. And I remember talking to Ray Mercer about this, that he thought it was one of the funniest things ever because that guy, Tim Sylvia had nothing for him. He did, he, I think he mentioned, said something like, it was like fighting someone that his opponent was in the pool and I wasn't. Yeah. That's how slow Sylvia was to him. And then, you know, and then he made the whole timber joke about him falling over how big he was. But uh, that that was that was the terrible. And because of that, but it, he didn't really cost him Sylvia money because the affliction deal that was going to pay him half a million fell apart because affliction fell apart. Mm. So in some ways, you'd say, man, you made a terrible mistake getting your fighter beat up this way and losing out on this five hundred thousand dollar payday. At affliction, but that deal would never happen because Josh Barnett failed his drug test, and so the third affliction content uh, event never took place. Man, the good old days. <laughs> what happened to the sponsorship procurement manager? After the drying up of the, the competition, the big thing managers did because they couldn't play the promotions against each other because the UFC would get very upset when you tried to play the promotions against each other. Uh, they took their, you know, I mean, Sam Spira, Spira the, the representative of, uh, of, uh, of Randy Couture is no longer really in the, doesn't, you know, manage people in the UFC because they got upset that he did that. Jeff Clark with Roger Huerta, UFC does not like when you play people against each other with them. And so managers stopped trying to get the promotions to, out, you know, to, to drive up the price for their fighters. And plus, the other promotions couldn't compete the UFC anymore. And so what they did is the UFC was a, gave them a place on the broadcast that they could sell sponsorship revenue to. And this is the era of where the sponsorship revenue is, revenue is great. Everybody got a T-shirt deal. Everybody's wearing a, a terrible affliction shirt or <laughs> some other brand. Everybody had their logo, the shorts covered in logos. They had the, the banner up in their corner. And so a lot of fighters were making multiples, what they were with their sponsorship and then what they were in their in their fight purses. And so they, they in some ways they thought it was worth it. Like, you know what? I won't hassle the UFC for more pay in my purse because I'm making so much more just being in the UFC. And the managers that became specialists were all they did is they they would Jeff Clark had a whole team that would try to find various, you know, they would be on the phone all the time working with attorneys and stuff to get their deals special, you know, as many sponsorship deals as they could for their fighters under contract. And then there's other managers that were hired directly by brands, right? And then they would parcel out those sponsorship and they would take a cut of that. And that's that's a little bit, that's where the fiduciary duty kind of breaks down. And that seems a little bit of a conflict of interest because your duty as a manager is to get your fighter the best deal possible. But when you're representing also the sponsor, your deal for them is, well, I get to make more money by giving my fighter a worse deal. And so that you saw some conflicts with that. I thought it was a little sleazy by a lot of managers back then. But that was what the, the sponsor procurement manager, but then the, the sponsorship tax and eventually the, the Reebok deal basically put an end to that. You, you don't really see managers operating that way anymore. I'm going to take a little sidestep here. What about handlers? And the reason I ask this is because the Kawas used to have a guy, a handler guy for John Jones. But could you talk about a little bit about handlers? Now, I don't know if anybody in the UFC has one. I know that guy in particular, he, he left the Kawas like six, seven years, maybe even longer, about seven years ago. You might have to be more clear on which guy that is, because there's also, remember, they used to have Wayne Harriman, mm -hmm. Wayne Harriman with them. Who? No, this was somebody else. I, I can't reveal his name, but uh, yeah. he did work w very closely with John Jones. And, you know, he did the same thing, though. He worked as a procurement manager and he worked sort of as a handler. I mean, they hired him specifically for John Jones. Well, I mean, John Jones is a special case. And so, he. I mean, there was also rumors that John Jones had a piece of first row management for years. Oh. I don't know if that ended up being true or not, but that was the, the the word that he had a piece. And also there was the word that he did not uh, have to really pay 
the cow was anything because his name being attached to him was what got him to other clients that he used him to sell. And that seems to be kind of true because remember he said for years, those guys have never been negotiating my deals. Oh yeah, that's true. And so, but the other thing about the cow is remember that they were also the, Dana White would not deal with them. And so the cow was, had to get intermediary uh, in um, Wayne Harriman, who is an interesting guy. He's a, he's a good friend of Dana Waite, the Pratitas, but he also used to be a member of the Buffalo Mafia and was investigated for drug smuggling and uh, with uh, with the Hell's Angels and uh, and possibly was a confidential informant. Uh, I'm not. We don't know the full details of that yet. But uh, so he is an interesting background, an organized crime figure, but he would he would negotiate John Jones deals with the Pratitas and and Dana White. And and they would instead of seeing the cow was they would deal with that guy directly and he would negotiate it, even though his name wasn't on or part of the uh, first role management. He, he wasn't a partner or anything there, but they would have to pay him to go do this for him. Let's talk about managers maximizing the platform. Okay, when we mean the platform, we mean basically being on the UFC as a platform. The okay. UFC is giving you a platform to increase your brand awareness and 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 make fans and be you know more known. And this is kind of the evolution of where the business has gone over the years, uh, because you had first the guys playing the promotions against each other that dried up. Then you had people procuring management uh, sponsorship, but that really dried up with the Reebok deal. And so the next step was we have guys like Adi Attar, and uh, he's got Conor McGregor. It was hard to negotiate with the UFC to get, uh, you know, there, there was no leverage because you're tied to the UFC and there wasn't a lot of competition out there for you to get a big purse because you can't leave the UFC except for the, the McGregor fight, I mean, the Mayweather fight, which was a specialty. But what you can do is say, I'm going to use the UFC, and his is probably the most extreme version because he's like, I'm going to use the UFC to now uh, to market my brand of Proper 12 whiskey. And so that's what he did. He goes, I'm, I can't really negotiate like a, a boxing cut where I get 50, 60, 70% of the revenue I bring in, but I can use this access to the UFC that I can now sell something else, and that envelope made a ton of money. And you see uh, Dustin Poirier's kind of done the same, right, with his uh, his hot his uh, hot sauces. Thank yeah. you. And then, you know, there's other guys trying to do the same, like Sean O'Malley with marijuana. And there's, there's other guys trying to use the platform that I've become famous because of the UFC, so I'm going to start a podcast. I'm going to start all these endeavors outside the UFC, outside where I'm not using my, my appearance on the fight itself where you would normally make your money. I'm going to use the fame to gain access or, or to sell stuff outside the UFC. And that's where guys like Tim Simpson seems to specialize in Audi Atar, who've taken really a strong advantage of that. But we talked about on a previous episode, there's a, the, the contracts have changed. And so I don't know what even this brand of manager is going to last longer, be around much longer because they now entered, they now introduced language that says the UFC owns the rights to inventions and stuff products that you make why under UFC contract. <laughs> Some question about it, does it have to have a UFC logo or not? But it's strong. Enough, the language is vague enough that it probably will, will give the UFC a good cut of all those if, if people come up with products while under UFC co contract. Insane. Absolutely insane. So you mentioned that there was a rumor that John Jones actually owned a piece of first row management. There is a similar rumor. I mean, it's almost widely confirmed because i think it is confirmed that yes. connor owns part of um paradigm is that true uh, at least the mma branch he probably owns a paradigm at least he gets a cut of it because he was taunting and we, exactly. people probably remember taunting michael bisming the fact that i get a cut of your what, what you earn yes that's where i was and, going with that so and so that seems to confirm that that rumor okay why are some managers called brokers well there's a lot of criticism of managers. And when you think of the worst managers, the ones that everybody criticized, they're usually the ones we would call brokers. And what brokers are, a broker isn't a manager. A broker works uh, for an entity, in this case, the promotions, to acquire talent for them, to go out and get, you know, they're, they're basically seeking talent for them. They're not representing the fighters per se. They're representing the promotion to get them fighters. And that, that flips the dynamic because, your interest now is not in protecting the fighter and making them make the most. Your interest is making sure the promotion is happy because they're going to keep you employed by sending them, you know, letting you sign, signing more fighters that you send their way. And then you get a percentage of other contracts. And so now you're no longer working quite away in a quality 
uh, uh, nature, you're working in a quantity because you get a piece of all these fighters. And it's, it's, it's really, it's really disturbing in some ways because, you know, it's also, there, it's also scary in some ways because there are situations, let's say the UFC will favor these, these brokers. And so in many ways, these brokers can get you a better deal because the UFC wants those brokers to get their fighters a better deal because they want fighters to sign with those guys because they know those guys will cause less problems. And so a, a good a good example would be, and we're not going to use names, but let's say you have a, a manager that's giving the UFC a hard time, right? And the UFC, Dana White might even say, listen, you should go talk to this other manager. Your manager's a joke. Go talk to this other manager. And so you go talk to the manager Dana White sends you to, which is one of the brokers, and that manager says, I'll talk to the UFC and he comes back and goes, I got you 10 percent. The UFC will give me 10% more than what they were going to give your what your manager got. Now that sounds like, my God, this manager did a great job. He got me a better deal. But the truth is, the UFC, they, because they control the market, they can pay a lot more than they normally do, right? Mm -hmm. But they're like, we didn't want to pay, we because we have an opposite, we didn't want to pay to that other manager too much. But because now you're going to sign to a manager we like and who's going to cause less problems and make you do what we want to do, we're willing to give this bump up. It's much less than what we could possibly, we really should pay you, but it's more with the other manager because it'll make you sign with that guy. And so now this manager looks like a much better manager than everybody else and other fighters will probably sign with them and the UFC will be happy. Do managers actually try? Do, do they give a shit about their fighters? I think there's several managers that do, but there's 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 a, there's a lot of managers. Obviously, there's a hand, there's several managers that all they care about is keeping the UFC happy because the more the fighter that way they can really they offer is access to the UFC. You know, you sign with me not because I'm going to represent and give you the best representation, but because you sign with me, the UFC likes me. I can get you in the door to the UFC, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or as like I said before, they can give you a slightly better deal, or they can give you a title fight faster because the UFC likes them. It's not that they're gonna give you a much they're not gonna give you these guys are not gonna go to the not gonna go to the, the the ground, you know, they're not gonna go to the matches for you to get you a massive deal that you deserve. But because you have the UFC likes them, they can give you advantages that other managers can't. But the other managers, so the problem with the other managers is the UFC and, and this is not let's say you're you're not dealing with the UFC. You're because there's just a handful of promotions You've got to keep these small number of promotions happy because otherwise you're out of business. So does it help your, does it, if, even if you want to do the best for your fighter, does it help them to piss the UFC, UFC off so much that they, they, they won't work with you and punish your fighter as a result or punish your other fighters? Let's say you represent 10 fighters. And because you're pushing so hard doing your fiduciary duty for this one fighter, they're basically going to punish all your other fighters. Well, that's a really chilling effect because you're not like I gotta also be worried about my other fighters. Do I can I can I risk pushing that hard on one fighter and then hurt all my other fighters? And so, because of the power, the the one sided nature of the relationship, yeah, even fighter, even managers that would like to do more for their fighters, I think they feel that they they can't, they they really can't. What happens to managers that upset the UFC? Well, I mean, we got a lot of examples. I mean, one thing you notice, they're not around anymore, <laughs> right? This is true. The, the managers that did the best job of playing promotions against each other. And we, we talked about, Monty Cox was actually one of those guys that did that. Mm -hmm. uh, Zinkin from Zinkin Entertainment, the old school. They, they don't really met, represent many people anymore, right? Uh, you, Jeff Clark is out of the business, I believe. And he's the one that played, you know, got guided Roger Ward to leave the UFC. Because, is Bob, Bob is crazy Bob Cook still doing I think stuff? he, I think he quit. He's done with the business. So, or he's in the business, but no longer representing or training people at all. So, yeah, and, but he uh, actually served a dual role there because he worked very closely with Zinkin and actually negotiated some of the deals. I know that for, for, oh yeah, yeah. He worked at AKA and, yes, uh, and yes. Zinkin together. So yes. yes. I mean, that was the whole part of it. Dinkin and AKA were tied together that they would, you know, a lot of the fighters they would represent were at AKA in the early days. They they had a very unique relationship, right? They did. Yes. It was a, I mean, it was a, but and they also, and it, it's kind of a conflict of interest. They also did a, a they also helped strike force out a lot. Now mm -hmm. that's a conflict of interest in many ways because of man, there, there should be a separation between a manager and a promoter. Mm -hmm. But from their point of view at the same time, it's like we're building some sort of minor competitor to the UFC to give our fighters more leverage. Because with you know without that our fighters have no options. They just go to the UFC. We're trying to get at least another option out on the 
on the market. So it's, you know, it, it is a conflict of interest, but it's a little more understandable in a space where there's not much competition. But the other ones too is like, you look at Markel Martin that was representing uh, Nganu. Mm-hmm. He, he's pretty much out of the business now. Uh, UFC would not negotiate him with him. So I think Nganu basically dropped him because he couldn't negotiate with the UFC because UFC refused to talk to him. And then all of his other fighters have basically left because the UFC was cutting him out of the UFC. Wow. And so that that's the way they work. So that's, you see that time and time again with anybody that tried to uh, to play multiple promotions against each other to, to increase, especially the UFC against another promotion to increase their pay. Sam Spera, that we talked about him. Those guys are, are persona non grata in the UFC, and so they they they're the UFC doesn't talk to them. And then the next step is if, if the UFC is not negotiating, if you're not negotiating for me with the UFC, like Masvidal said to Kawa and John Jones, if you're not if you're not doing the negotiations for me, what what am I paying you for? Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned Sam Spira there, and uh, I feel like we should let everybody know that 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 was Randy Couture's manager for a while, an attorney. He 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 sought out a good one, but like John said, he couldn't he, get the. Well, he, he couldn't. He get did. Tenure. He's the guy that took the gamble. Yeah. That guided Randy to to basically challenge the UFC to get out of his contract yeah. to go fight Fader. Yeah. And that's when there was a whole lot, you know, back and forth lawsuit, and because it was, it ended up being. The, con- the the lawsuit went back to Vegas and it was going to drag on and Randy was 40 and he'd spent half a million. There, I mean, there's a possibility he would have won, but he's like, at my age, I can't burn through this money and wait this long, which yeah. was the you know, season 10. Do the fighters really need managers? I mean, Bobby Green says that he's self-managed now. And Paul Daly was very famous for that. He self-managed him literally his whole career almost. Oh, and Sean O'Malley. Sean O'Malley is another one. Um, you know, there's there's a few out there that are self managing. So, do do fighters need managers? I think uh, I do think some fighters need management, especially the fighters that are going to play. If if you're a big enough fighter that you can play promotions against each other, you probably want someone that knows the industry a little bit, uh, that that knows the market value within the industry and get you a better deal, right? But for the large majority of fighters in the UFC, the, the UFC's pay is tiered. It's it's set. You already know what you're going to get. You know what you're going to get when you come on to the UFC. You know what you're going to when you go on to the Ultimate Fighter. The contract's already drawn out, so you know what you're going to make. You know what they pay on a second tier to a contract, the second contract, the third contract. All that stuff is mostly already dictated. A, a manager might help you in a sense like, now's the time to negotiate on this fight and not wait to the next one. But a lot of fighters have been in the business long enough and know enough people and seen how it works that they also know that after this, after two wins in a row, I should go renegotiate, right? That they're, they're going to, we're going to want to negotiate and get a bump up to the next tier, but everything is, is a formula. So it, for a large number of fighters, it doesn't really make sense to have a manager, right? Uh, the, the other thing is the managers no longer, like we said, they don't get the sponsorship. In many ways, the UFC is the person providing the sponsorship mm-hmm. for a lot of fighters. They're the ones that have deals with sponsors that they're going to hire fighters, uh, that they're going to say, the, the sponsors go to the UFC and say, we have 20% of the budget we're going to pay you that we want to go to fighters to show up for events and, and wear our brands. And so the UFC is the one going to give those deals to their fighters. The managers aren't. So a manager still works if you have a big enough name where they can get you deals outside the UFC, and there's some that still do that, and that you plan and are willing and you and you are intent on basically testing the market or at least pretending to test the market enough to try to get a better deal. But I think, surprisingly, I think Paula Costa's girlfriend might have done a pretty good job. Mm. That, you know, it, it sounds shocking. It sounds like an idiot movie. You hired your girlfriend. But unlike other managers... She doesn't have other clients, right? Right. So she they, they can't use the threat like, oh, we're just gonna we're gonna screw over all your other clients now, hurt hurt them because we don't like your moves. No, she's just representing this one person. So the threat is real that we are gonna leave the UFC. So she, you know, read the contract, saw that his contract's up. They could play the game like we are we legitimately have the threat and the option because we're a big enough name that there's possibilities outside the UFC. We can play that game, and she did it. And you know, you see the same thing with uh, Nate Diaz's uh, mm-hmm. uh, manager, uh, agent. Actually, he's an attorney, but after the manager, I guess you'd say the same. They're very similar. And, and when you represent your fighter, you're basically a manager in boxing and MMA. He did the same because he only represents Nate Diaz, and so 
those those are the if you can find someone to represent you and no one else, you're probably in a better situation. But for the vast majority of fighters, I, it's hard to say how much they really do for you. This is the part of the the, the show where John's going to give us a campfire story. So I want you to tell me about the story from 2009 about managers trying to make a union. <laughs> Well, it's kind of funny because managers can't form a union. They're they're not right. uh, they're not employees, but apparently that was the idea. Back in 2009, UFC 100, that is when they first introduced, you remember, the sponsorship tax. Mm -hmm. They radically increased it. And that's that ripples through the management. Now, the year before in 2008, the managers, uh not the managers, but the uh strike for Elite XC went under and they kept everybody under contract. And the managers to those fighters are upset because now like what's we're trapped in these contracts, but there's a market out there. We can get our fighters better deals. We can get out on the market now. And so they went to Rob Macy of the MMAFA, right? And back then it was, you know, just a thought. And they got him to file a lawsuit to try to get them to break the contracts, the, the, the declare their contract, their fighters free agents, but nothing, it didn't, there was, it was negotiated peace because it ended up elite, assets ended up being bought by strike force so strike force acquired those contracts but apparently some fighter some manager agent uh got the idea that if since macy was arguing that we should get the fighters to, to organize as an association to work together they said instead of having the fighters organize one of the managers did and my understanding that it was ken pavia that thought of this but i don't know it could be another one but this is <laughs> that we should get the management should work together and we could run the business, right? And apparently it was Ed Soros and Zinkin and, you know, Bob Cook and Zinkin and uh, oh, I can't remember the other big names at the time, like six or seven of them. Uh, Dan Lambert, an America top team. Uh, I think he did a podcast where he talked about the managers trying to make a union at some point. So, but anyways, they, they were supposedly going to get organized. And uh, it, the whole point was we were going to work together to fight the back against the UFC for the sponsorship tag. And it didn't, it, it after one meeting, the whole thing fell apart because apparently they had a spy, one of the other ones called Dana White, and he called in and said, what the hell are you guys doing? And the whole thing broke apart. And then, you know, Ken Pavia was persona non grata. Something else came from this. Yeah. The infamous video of Dana cursing Loretta Hunt because she was the one that reported on this. And so he made this video where he cursed her up one side and down the other. He referred to Kim Pavia as a homophobic slur multiple times, and it, uh, it enraged Glad. And so Glad came out, and they forced a public apology from the UFC over that. Well, it's one correction, though, it wasn't about this, uh, the, the uh, agent, the union's agent. It was about the, the UFC basically blocking managers right. from going in the, the backstage. Um, and oh, there were some, right. there that's were some, right. that's right. Yeah. But, but close up, there were some, and what's funny is there were some minor mistakes, not minor mistakes, but minor, uh, um, uh, uh, there were some minor errors in Loretta Hunt's report, but the general gist of it was correct, but it wasn't her fault. You know, she's getting right. information from other sources telling her, and she's just trying to interpret it. But because of that, the UFC instantly, Dan Weisman targeted those mistakes and basically said she was, you know, the whole thing was a lie, but there was some truth that they were changing their, you know, but talking to multiple people at the time that there was, that the, the general gist of her, her, uh, her report was, was pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is amazing though, how many fans, and this just shows the, the difference of the world, you know, how many fans instantly sided with Dana White back then on that. And I found that disturbing. At the yes. Time. Right. Does the UFC operate as a manager with their sponsorship deals? Uh, in many ways, they do. And if you read the uh, Muhammad Ali uh, Boxing Reform Act and, and a lot of the state regulations about how when they define a manager, the purpose of a promoter under those definitions is basically to, to promote the fight. That's the that's the promoter's job. But the UFC operates in a way where they not only do they get you, they promote the fight. They find you the opponent. That's technically a manager's job is to find you the opponents, right? It's they also find you sponsorship and other outside uh, endeavors to that you're signed to. That's also a manager's job, not a promoter. So in many ways, the the UFC has taken over the job of what is a manager does in boxing. 
we have said the B word, boxing, break it down. Why does boxing management seem so much better? Well, I, it's hard to say. I say better is, you know, a sub, subjective because there's a lot of terrible boxing management and they have a long history of terrible, crooked management. But but one thing better about boxing is they've now put a bunch of regulations and laws to fix some of the horrible, horrible management they used to have with the, again, the Ali Act we brought up before, that you, you can have a conflict of interest. There's a firewall between being a promoter and a manager. So in boxing, you can't operate as a manager and a promoter or have compensation unless it's for a non-title or non-major fight. So if it's under 10 rounds, you can operate as a manager and a promoter. And the basic theory to that is uh, for a lot of managers, because if you're, if you're promoting, if you're managing a fighter and you need to build them up and you can't find opponents, they would often stage the fights themselves just to give their guys some ring time, right? And so that theory is you're allowed to do that. Now, some managers still try to take advantage of that by by. It, let's say they have a problem with their fighter and they don't want to lose them. They try never to give them more than an eight round fight because then they're not violating the Ali act. But, uh, but that's not nearly the problem it used to be. So you don't have the problem today in boxing. Like you did when Don King was around mm -hmm. famous case, Don King, uh, Mike Tyson sued him. Right. And he sued him because, you know, basically Don King, he thought was not, you know, was stealing money, but also because Don King had signed, given him, two puppet managers to work with and Don, you know, Horn and Holloway, two guys. So Don King, you know, Mike Tyson had a uh, sued him for like 300 million. What's, what's interesting about that, in that lawsuit, if you look through it, um, Don, the, the lawsuit, Mike Tyson, all the purses he made, all the money that was generated in those fights, Mike Tyson is arguing he should have made like 50 to 60% of all the money that was generated. And he claims, you know, Don King ripped him off. And I think I added up once and he still, Don King still paid him like 37, 40% of the revenue. Wow. So, so still way more than what you would see in, in MMA, but he was getting ripped off. Uh, but Don King famously would have his, you know, a son manage, uh, uh, fighters and, or have multiple people manage a fighter and then they would send money back to him. So, those kind of crooked deals have ended, but also management in, in uh, boxing, the manager has, they're not as beholden to promoters, right? Promoters have power, but there's multiple promoters and they're because of the sanction orders are separate. They, there's a purpose to them. Their purpose for the major management is not only to go over the contracts and negotiate deals, but also to guide your career, to pick opponents, to pick like, when are you ready to fight a certain opponent? Which opponent's going to set you up for the bigger fight, right? Uh, which opponent? So like, uh, 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 you know, De Devin Haney kind of manages himself with his, mm -hmm. his dad, yep. but but they, they have to make a choice. Do they want to sign with a promoter or be independent? They decided recently to sign a three fight deal with top rank. Now, if that might've been a risk, but he got a big purse against two big purses against uh, Cambosis and rematch. He could have made more though, and uh, probably somewhere else, but because of that now he gets a pay-per-view event versus Lomachenko and gets to be a free agent again. And so stuff like that is where a promoter, a manager guides their, their fighter to choose which, when do you want to serve a, sign a longer term contract with the promoter? When do you want to go short term? When do you want to challenge certain fighters? Cause then it gives you the leverage of, you know, raising the ranks or getting a title that you can then leverage for a bigger fight. So there's much more, um, uh, much more swimming through the seas of the industry for a manager to guide a boxer through in boxing. So they have much more importance there. What's interesting is management used to be much more powerful. The, the early days, if you go back to the early 20th century, you notice the promoters were afterthoughts. The guys that controlled boxing were the managers, Rickert and all these other guys, uh, Tex Winters and all these guys that, uh, that guided, that basically owned the heavyweight crown because they dictated the terms. The, the promoter would just bid and hold one event and there'd be in the, the, an afterthought. But because of the corruption cases, because of regulations that came in, uh, there was limits put on promoters and that's when I'm opening for guys like Don King and Aram to then take over the sport. And then the, the promoter became the major force in boxing. And then we see MMA imitating boxing, seeing what they did. And though MMA, it's, it's basically the promoters are the almost the entire entity of the sport, namely the UFC. But the promoters like UFC and Bellator, they control everything. The sanctioning organizations, the UFC, they operate as the promotion. 
They operate as a sanctioning organization, and in many ways, they operate as the manager by determining, you know, dictating to the fighter who they're going to fight, and also dictating, uh, you know, also dictating sponsorship deals and outside other other outside deals. What about guys like Al Heyman? He's an interesting character to me because he sort of oversees, maybe has a guiding hand. I don't know. Yeah, I think you you said advisory to me earlier today. And that's an interesting role to have because uh, Javonta Davis has been saying since October of last year that he is now self-managed. But guys like Al Heyman sort of help guide them a little bit. Can you sort of explain that a little? Well, Al Heyman calls himself an advisor. And there's some question, uh, does he break the Alley Act? Now, now, over the years, he's now come out and said, basically, I operate as a manager. I'm a manager. Uh, I fall under management rules. But the argument for a while was, as an advisor, he didn't violate the the, the firewall between promoter and manager. Because mm. the, the case that was presented against him by Top Rank and Golden Boy was, he's managing these boxers, but also because he, he works with PBCs operating as a promoter, and that's a violation of the Ali Act. Now, the one reason he's not violating the Ali Act, the one major reason, is complaints of violating the Ali Act can't come from other promotions. The Ali Act does not protect promotions. It protects boxers. So the only ones that could accuse Heyman of violating the Ali Act would be his own boxers. And since none of them file charges, right, he's not violating the Ali Act. They are not upset with the services he's providing. And... And as you know, a lot of boxers are seem to be very happy with what he does because mm -hmm. his business model in many ways is, I mean, in many ways is like he tries to make a bigger promotion as possible, but his business model is I get money on the back end from you, the boxers, because I get a percentage. So the, what I want to do is get you the biggest purse as possible. Mm -hmm. And under that business model, it's hard for a lot of boxers to get upset because you know, it's like, well, maybe he is violating the Alley Act. I don't really care because he's getting me the biggest purse possible. All right. I have two final questions for you. The first one, going back to when Mike Tyson first got out of jail, he set himself up with the biggest purse of all time back then. He got a $26 million purse to fight Peter McNeely right out of jail. How did that come together? Well, that that purse he got was that that's part of that lawsuit deal. Actually, when he got out oh, of uh, okay. Don King negotiated that. In fact, we were talking about uh, his bogus management was was there, uh, Horn and Holly, who ended up suing after that because he didn't want to cut them in. But Don King put this this great deal together. But Don King also got a big chunk of that purse. Ah. Uh. Okay. And my second question, my final question, talk a little bit about Floyd Mayweather because he is an entity unto himself, self-promoted, self-managed, just lay his, his career path out to us as it unfold, unfolded, because you tell it better from the financial angle. Well, yeah, he's an interesting case because, uh, I mean, he's a, he, it really is a unique case. It's hard to compare any other fighter to him, and because he, he came at a special time, and he and he did something that no other no other fighters did. But he developed under top. He signed with top rank, and he was a. People think he was basically he was doing nothing, but he was actually a draw as a fighter. I mean, he was selling uh, his earlier fights uh, with top rank before he went off on his own. He was selling, you know, uh, with Agati and stuff like three hundred thousand dollars, three hundred thousand buys, right? So. These were very successful pay-per-views at the time, but he felt that top rank was underestimating his potential, right? And so he famously, there's a deal, he had a, 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 a some portion of his contract that said he could buy it out for $700,000. I believe he got, my understanding is he went to Heyman and Heyman uh, advanced him the money to help him pay for that. And then that's where Heyman was his advisor. And and you can't, I mean, Mayweather, Heyman plays a big part of this because I think Heyman also understood the, the vast potential, because Heyman comes from the uh, the touring business, the vast potential money that was out there in the fight business that wasn't being tapped into, um, and this is something I don't. There's there's oh, just on one example what Heyman does. If you look at the secondary market for tickets, right? Secondary market is you you know you 
you you buy your tickets from the arena, and then the bunch of scalpers put on the second market and jack up the price, right? Well, Heyman knows to set aside a bunch of these tickets for the second, and then so that him and the fighters can sell this on the secondary market, make a lot more than what they would just from the gate. And so there's stuff like that. These little things were pieces of you know, like like Mayweather getting pieces of the uh, uh, the concession stand and stuff probably came from uh, uh, Heyman advising. And so he paid off his contract. He was making millions with Top Rank. He bought out his contract for seven hundred thousand uh, dollars. He agreed to a fight with Oscar De La Hoya because uh, and Oscar again. The people that said that there was no appeal to Floyd Mayweather, who famously changed his identity to money at that time, people said there was no appeal to Floyd Mayweather. Well, Oscar chose him for a reason, because obviously there was a there was interest in Floyd Mayweather. But uh, as the business of boxing works, if you if you get into a big fight, um, often one plus when you have two superstars, two plus two does not equal four for the uh, for the business it does. Two plus two can equal eight or sixteen. And so Floyd fighting Oscar did much, Oscar was already a star, but Floyd fighting Oscar did mega business because it just it was a multiplying effect. And because Floyd looked so uh, great against Oscar, it did, did a big rub off effect. And now he became a, big, a, a massive star and his image and his, his, his know-how with uh, Heyman, he, he basically, that's the guy that guided his career choosing the right opponents at the right time. And I don't mean that in the way like the right opponent, like people criticize Mayweather for like, you know, fighting loser, you know, picking and choosing his opponents. I mean, he fought a killer. He fought up until the very end of his career. He fought uh, a murderer's role, especially for a guy that was a lighter weight fighter and moved up. He fought a, a murderer's role of opponents for a while there, but he picked the right opponent at the right time to build up his prestige and cash in with as much money as possible. Jumped to HBO Showtime at the right time. So I, I don't see, I mean, he's an amazing guy to follow for a business sense of how he, he's done the two biggest pay-per-views of all time by far uh, with McGregor and, and Pacquiao. So it's not a mistake that the same guy did that. And on top of that, he has a, just a row of probably four of the next six pay-per-views as well. And the number of the gates and stuff as well, the two ties gates. I mean, the guy's business sense, what he's accomplished is way beyond any other fighter. But uh, he's he's. It's hard to see if anybody else imitating him because I think he came at a perfect time when there was you know there was the 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 you could you could play the the promotions against each other you know go independent like he could and on top of the pay per view business that exploded at just the right time and before I don't know if the pay per view business will do if in the future it might do more because. Every generation, boxers seem to make more than the previous generation. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, you can talk about it being less popular, but it's easier to sell and make money on the fights the longer it goes on because we find new ways to the market make money. But there is a question, will that continue because of streaming and piracy? And uh, he's just, he's a, he's a one in a million. He is, the, he is money Mayweather, like him or, or hate him. He is lightning in a bottle, really. Yes, I mean, McGregor is probably the closest we've mm -hmm. seen to someone coming along but mcgregor he's an mma he doesn't have the opportunity to cash in on his name independently like like uh mayweather could he you because of mma because the ufc has you know the market power because ufc controls them the, they operate as sanction organization the promotion the man all that together there's no opportunity to do what go into business on your own like mayweather could i mean McGregor, even if mcgregor could have got out of the ufc he could wouldn't have the opponents that mayweather had because they all would be locked in the contract with the UFC. Yep. Okay, John. So I lied. I, I have another question. I'm so sorry. We're going to extend this a little bit more. But I need to know why. Boxing promoters and the athletes are so close. It seems like an unbreakable thread. It's different in the UFC. The fighters don't go to Ari Emanuel and the board at Endeavor to work out the, 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 the fine points of their deals. They work through a manager or through whoever the UFC has operating that part of logistics, I would assume. But in boxing, it's so much different. Why? Well, in, in MMA, again, because the UFC has such leverage, you don't have much options as a fighter. So they, they dictate the terms. They tell you who you're going to fight, when you're going to fight, where you're going to fight, and you either say yes or if you say no, you're put on the freezer on the shelf for a while, right? But boxing, especially the big name boxers, 
because the fighters have the boxers have options because they, they can go to their promotion because the promoter is dependent on that boxer to draw revenue for their promotion. Uh, the UFC has contracted revenue. They can, you know, they, they, they make money no matter what, whoever fights. So they don't even need specific fighters, but top rank needs, uh, you know, they, they need, uh, especially Warren, their partner, the Queensberry promotions. They need Tyson Fury to fight because they get money from that. Uh, match room, uh, Eddie Earn definitely needs Anthony Joshua to fight. A big chunk of the revenue per year is from Anthony Joshua. Golden Boy used to be almost exclusively dependent on Canelo Alvarez. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the PBC is a little different because they're not a promoter. They use, you know, Goosen and all these other promotions uh, who are basically hired by PBC or hired by the boxers. But they're all dependent on the boxers generating the revenue directly those, those so those fighters have a lot more power and because of that, they have a different relationship with the promoter they work with the promoter the promoter in many ways works for those boxers so the the the, the, the boxer and their manager get together and the promoter and they might all get together and say who's my next opponent be who will generate the most money uh you know uh do i want to fight if i'm wilder you're wilder you're working with the promoter when you're with pbc or your joshua you know like do i do i want to fight wilder uh, or do I want to fight uh, Dillian White or who? But Eddie Hearn can't dictate that to Joshua. He needs Joshua to sign on. And so Joshua can come back to him and tell him exactly who he wants to fight. And Eddie Hearn can say, okay, I'll make that fight happen. And that's what happened with Golden Boy. Ryan Garcia, you know, he's the one that said, I want to fight Tank Davis. I demanded. Now, if a fighter says that uh, to Scott Coker at Bellator or Dana White in the FC, they laugh at him say, you don't have me saying this. But when Ryan Garcia says that to uh, Oscar De La Hoya and Golden Boy, they got to make him happy because they need the money that comes from his fights. And so he he dictated that that fight's going to happen. Now, they should have been happy because it ended up being a mega fight. He gets 50% and they get a small percentage of that. So they're going to make more money off that than they would normally. But that's, that's the way it is because promoters are – the boxers are the primary movers in the sport – and promoters are important, and often, you know, promoters are, I don't want to exaggerate boxers' power, that's the top boxers. A lot of boxers are dependent on promoters, and they, you know, they, they, the promoter has the leverage over them still. But for the top boxers, they drive the sport, the promoters have to work with them. As, if not working for them, they have to at least treat them as partners. And there you have it, folks, the long and the short of management. <laughs> it's It's not the prettiest story, but... There, there were some bright spots. There are some good managers out there. Do you have a name for us? I don't well, know. The, the problem is I'm afraid to name managers because that means they know I'm talking to the guy. Oh. And so I like to pretend I hate them all because I don't okay. want to let go that some of them, because the truth is some managers see, contact me. They share information with me. They want me to do stuff like look at contracts. They want, and I, I, I tend to respect those managers because obviously they are looking out for, they want to know how stuff works. They can do better for their fighters other manager and so when i i know do not even read the contracts they're not aware of like changes in them and stuff and that to me that's kind of a, a signal to me like man you could be doing a better job yeah so there you have it this is why we don't reveal names john what do you got coming up in the next couple of weeks well, I'm going to start managing fighters. Um, <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to be doing that. Uh, next couple of weeks, I've got, I'm going to try to get an article out. Um, uh, we'll see if I have the time to do it. We're, it's a middle sweeps right now uh, for my job, which means we have deliveries for shows for TV. So I'm pretty busy, but I, I wanted to write something about uh, uh, Garcia Tank Davis. Uh, but I had pneumonia the week before, so I couldn't write anything on before the fight. But I, I do have an inkling. I just have a... a, a a bug about wanting to talk about because I think it's so amazing and so interesting how that fight blew up so big. Uh, I'd like to write some on that. Besides that, we have a new episode of Show Money that just came out, mm-hmm. and we're gonna do. We have some. Uh, uh, I have a, a maybe a special interview gonna come up. Uh, I was supposed to do it at the end of the week. I don't want to say in case I don't do it, but uh, that's up. And then we'll have more Hey Not the Face podcast coming up. And he did not win this week. He's no, not, we're not talking about that. We he's don't not taking a victory lap around Care Don't Care Boulevard. He did not. No, no one cares. No I, one I repeat, cares. he did not win. <laughs> no one cares about that card. Oh, my goodness. All right. So there you have it, folks. You know the drill. Until next time, please stay safe. It's not in the face. Woo!
Thank you. 